Uh, what a topic that we have set before us. Uh, we've got a good introduction on Islam last night, and we want to carry that forth. I have four sessions um, to give, three um, this morning and one tomorrow morning. And my, my sessions kind of all go together because I, I believe that God put certain desires in our hearts that we want. And we want these things. We seek these things. We cannot quit wanting these things. There's some things that we have a drive and we're pursuing. We're pursuing with all of our hearts, if you would. And, and God put those longings there. And one of those things is we want to know the truth. Knowing the truth is just something that's in all men. We, we want to know where we came from. We want to know, uh, is there a God? And we, I believe God put that knowledge in us that we do know there is a God. But we want to know how to live. We want to know um, also how to be right with God. And so God has put that in us. I believe that God put a sense of right and wrong. We have a moral compass. Um, Paul tells us in chapter 1 of Romans that we have the law written on our conscience. So we, we know right and for wrong. And because of that, we know that we're, we have sinned against our own conscience. We know what guilt feels like. Every individual has a sense of God and they have a sense of guilt. And there is the conflict that they know there's a God who is just and good, but they know by their own conscience they have not lived up to the standard that God requires of them. So people want to know truth. They want to know how to be right with God. They're looking for forgiveness. Or let's put it this way, man is looking for a remedy with his guilt. And ultimately, I believe man is looking for a relationship with God. And these are the four things that all men are looking for. And we're going to look at how does Islam provide answers to these four things. Truth, we're looking for salvation, we're looking for forgiveness, we're looking for a relationship with God. Let's look at how Islam provides answer for that. And we'll begin by looking at the Quran, and we're going to try to get a basic understanding of the Quran. And does the Quran give us a reliable source of divine revelation? Does the Quran give us truth? Can we trust the Quran? And as we look at this, we are Christians, and I assume most of us, if not all of us, are Christians here. We're going to be evangelizing Muslims, and we want to ask them, can you trust the Quran? Can you rely upon the Quran? Is it a reliable source of truth? Is this truth in the Quran, does it come from God? Did God really, truly reveal the revelation that is found in the Quran? Well, Muslims believe the Quran is eternal. That the Quran was never created. In fact, it's a sin if you say the Quran was created. They believe the Quran is eternal, and it's the only thing that is eternal besides God. They do not say the Quran is God, and, but they say it is uncreated. It's the uncreated Word of God. And it has eternally been written on gold tablets in Arabic. All that is written in the Quran has been eternally written on gold tablets and, and exist in heaven from all eternity. They believe when the Quran was given to Muhammad, it was given through dictation. Gabriel, who read the tablets, dictated them to Muhammad, who Muhammad either immediately memorized them or he would dictate them to a scribe and the scribe would pin it down. They believe the Quran is error-free. There's no mistakes. They believe the Quran is the final revelation of God. They expect no more new revelation. It is the final revelation 
of God. And they also believe the Quran is a miracle. In fact, they say it's a miracle because there's no way Muhammad could have wrote this himself. And the, some of the reasons they say the Quran is inspired and we can know it's inspired or divine is they have several proofs. The first proof is its unique literary style. In Surah chapter 2, or Surah, Surah 2, 23, it says, If you are in doubt about what we have re revealed to our servant, then produce a chapter like these. Call your witnesses apart from God if you are truthful. And another Surah 10, 38 says, Or do they say, he has forged it. Say then, produce a single chapter like it, and a call upon whomever you can, apart from God, if you are truthful. So if you doubt the Quran is the Word of God, try to reproduce or write a chapter like this. You'll find that you cannot do it. And so they say the Quran is so beautiful in its literary style that it's, it has no equals. And only God could write such a beautiful um, text as the Quran. Another proof that they have that the Quran is divine is that Muhammad was illiterate. One professor of Islamic studies, Dr. Maurice Brasella says, how could a man from being illiterate become the most important author in terms of literary merit in the whole Arabic literature. How could he pronounce facts of scientific nature that no other human being could have known at that time? And all this without once making the slightest error in his pronouncement on the subject. So here's Muhammad. He did not know how to read or write. How could he have created such wonderful literature that was, that's unparalleled in all of Arabic literature throughout history? How could Muhammad have done this? This must have been a miracle. Another reason they believe it's divine is they believe that the Quran has not had any um, imperfections through all of its transmissions. The original Quran that is written in, in heaven has been given to Muhammad and that is the exact, in the Arabic, it's the exact Quran that they say we have today, without one mistake, without one scribble error. It's been perfectly preserved throughout history. And that proves that it is a book divinely given. They say it has scientific accuracy, that, that Muhammad wrote things that only God could have written about scientific truth. And another thing that they say is proof of its divine origin is its overall unity that the Quran speaks truth and it doesn't contradict itself in any of its passages. And that is the one I want to particularly look at um, this morning. Can we trust the Quran? And we're going to see, does the Quran present a unified, cohesive message? Or does the Quran contradict itself? You know, when I was young, my... um parents hid our Christmas gifts, me and my brother's Christmas gifts, under the bed in a big box. And I don't know if it was my oldest brother James or if the next brother Jason, I don't know who found the goodie box, but before long we all knew about it. And um, we would make our little, you know, one time, it was meant to be a one time trip underneath the bed to see what we're getting for Christmas. And I remember opening up the box and digging through the things and playing with the toys, closing the box and slipping out. And, you know, I did that the next day and the next day. And, you know, it's just irresistible to go look and play with your toys. Eventually, my mother lined us up all in the kitchen. That's the way she does when we're in trouble. She puts us all there and begins to question us. She starts with James, my oldest brother. And she says, you know, someone has been playing with the Christmas gifts. And I want to know who, who is doing it. Of course, all of us were guilty. But 
James says, not me. He just lied. She, and, and, um, and my mom says, you know, I know one of you did it. Someone didn't close the box right. The box lid was not closed. And my next brother, Jason, goes, it wasn't me, Mom. I made sure I closed that box every time I looked. <laughs> you see, eventually, if you're not on the right path, if you do not have truth, you can't help but eventually contradict yourself. Lies or error cannot, by its very nature, support itself if you step back and look at the whole story. So that's what we have to do with the Quran. Does it present a cohesive story? Does it provide us with a cohesive world and life view? I'm here to say it doesn't. And when we evangelize Muslims, let's push them on this particular point. These other points we can look at and press them on too, but can you have, can you have a cohesive worldview? That's what we should ask them. Does the Quran provide us a reliable source of truth. Well, the way we're going to look at that this morning is we're going to seek to answer that one question, but we're going to do that by looking at the Quran through the eyes of the life of Muhammad. We can't really understand the Quran, the nature of the Quran, without understanding the life of Muhammad, because Muhammad is the one who per se, gave the Quran or uh, wrote the book. And he did this through a 23-year period. And I'm going to make it easy for us to memorize this. So rather than thinking about 23 years, we're just going to think 20 years. And we're going to divide up the 20 years into halves. The first 10 years, the second 10 years of his ministry. Uh, he lived to be 63 years old, but just think that he began at the age 40 and by the time he was 60, he was done. And so he has 40, his 40s, and his 50s. We're going to look at the, the Quran as it was revealed when he was 40 years old to his 50, and then look at the second portion from 50 to 60. Most of the Quran was revealed in the first 10 years of his ministry. Most of it. Um, I would say 75% of the Quran was revealed in the first 10 years. 25% of it in his last 10 years. Um, and the Quran is not a very big book. Um, it's right at 100,000 words, a little over 100,000 words, and that might not mean much to you, but that's just a normal size book. It's um, four-fifths of the size of the New Testament. And the New Testament is really not that big of a book. So it's not a, a large book, but most of it was written in the first 10 years of his ministry. And those first 10 years, I would call it the peaceful period of Muhammad. In fact, the peaceful Quranic passages of the first 10 years is between 610 to 622. And we'll look at this period first. And what we want to do is we want to look at the first 10 years and compare it with the second 10 years and see does the first 10 years match up with the second 10 years can we have a cohesive worldview based upon the stark difference between the revelation given in the first 10 years compared to the revelation given in the last 10 years? Well, Muhammad began his public ministry in the year 610. He was born in 570 in Mecca. And his dad died six months after he was born. His mother had already died during the... Uh, six months after his birth. And he mo moved in with his grandfather and two years after moving with his grandfather, his grandfather died and then he was given to his uncle. We learned about that last night. So his early life, he's just been passed around looking for someone to take care of him. He settles in with his uncle and his uncle was a, a successful businessman that had a lot of respect. And if it probably wasn't for his uncle, um, Muhammad would not have been able to survive that first 10 years because he was protected by his uncle. But at the age of 12, Muhammad, during one of the uh, merchant traveling uh, tours that he went on with his uncle, he 
meant a monk, a Christian monk, who prophesied over Muhammad, claiming Muhammad would be the next prophet at 12 years old. And it's important for us to realize this, that this is a Christian monk, more likely a heretical Christian monk, but it's a Christian monk who's making this prophecy over Muhammad. And this had an impact on Muhammad. I think this may have had an impact upon his monotheism because the Arabs were prolifically polytheist. But from a very young age, Muhammad may have been uh, interested in Christianity. And he had this amazing prophecy, if you would, placed upon him. Well, at the age of 25, he marries his first wife. We learned about that last week. And at the age of 40, uh, I'm 39, so I'm, I'm thinking about it. I mean, he's my age. He goes and he's praying in a cave not far from Mecca, and he receives his first revelation. Um, he's basically praying in this cave, and he hears this voice speaking to him. In fact, later we learn it, he believes it's Gabriel, but he didn't know it was Gabriel at the time. And Gabriel basically tackled him, squeezed him, and says, read. And Muhammad doesn't know how to read. Now, or it may have been recite. But what is he to recite? You know, like, and, and he kind of tries to wiggle away, and then Gable squeezes him tighter. And three times he keeps on saying recite. And finally, he submits to it. He recites. He's, it's Surah 96, if you want to read that. You can see the first prophecy is in uh, uh, Surah 96. And basically what that Surah says is that there's only one God. There's one God. Uh, so the beginning of this prophecy is the fact that Muhammad is convinced in monotheism. But after this, he goes into uh, from six, when he's 40 years old, it's the year 610, from 613 for three years, he just goes silent because he's afraid that he's demon-possessed. Um, Muslims believe in men, they believe in angels, and they believe in jinn. Jinn are kind of a half-human, half-angelic race. He thinks either he's possessed by Satan or he thinks it's, he's possessed by a jinn. But either or, and in fact, jinn can be evil, jinn can be good. They're kind of, it depends. They're not all, like angels, they're not all bad. They're not all good. Uh, but he's, he's, he's concerned. In fact, he thinks he's either demon-possessed or he thinks he's become a poet. And he hates poets. And um, we've got to remember in the culture back then, they didn't have the internet. And the way they were entertained and the way they learned was through oral tradition. And poets would come and they would recite different historical events or make up stories. Some of them would lie. Some of them would tell the truth. And so generally people did not like poets. Muhammad hated poets. And he was afraid that he had become a poet. And so he hated that. And he didn't want to be a poet. He didn't want to be demon-possessed. So he's convinced that this is not good. And so he becomes suicidal. Um, one biography reads, None of, of God's creatures were more hateful to me, this is Muhammad, than poets. I could not even look at them. I thought, woe is me. I'm a poet or I'm possessed. So he's troubled by this dilemma. So for three years, he doesn't, he doesn't tell anyone but his wife. But his wife helps reassure to him that this is not demon possession, that this may truly be a true prophecy from God. And eventually, he was convinced, not just by his wife, but by a Christian prophet. Uh, who reassures him that th he's not just possessed, but rather, rather he's the prophet that Moses prophesied about. 
And so he accepts that. He accepts the fact, hey, I'm a prophet of God. And then he begins to publicly preach. Once he embraces his calling, that he's a prophet or an apostle sent by God, he embraces this calling and he begins to publicly preach in the year 613. And what we need to realize about his first years of preaching is he's preaching about monotheism. That's his main desire. He's not trying to um, take over the world at this point. He's just trying to convince the polytheistic polytheist that there's only one God. His main focus was the message, God is one and I am his prophet. And there's a judgment day to prepare for. That's essentially the focus of his early ministry. Surah 112, which was written very early in his ministry, he says this, Say, he is Allah, the one and only. Allah, the eternal, absolute. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. In fact, this is the first pillar of Islam, the Shahada. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger or prophet. He thought the Jews and Christians would accept him as one of their own. Because he believed in mon monotheism, and he, he was influenced by Christianity, he just naturally assumed that once he saw that he was a prophet, Christians and Jews would be would welcome him. And I, it seems like Muhammad only knew the scriptures, Old and New Testament, by oral tradition, and like, like we heard last night, through some heretical teaching. He did not have access to the scriptures. He did not have a copy of the Old Testament, the Torah. He did not have a copy of the Psalms or the Gospel. He knew about some of the content, but only through oral tradition, what had been told him through his travels and through his interactions with others. So he had a misunderstanding of many of the major doctrines of the Bible. Muhammad did have, had no biblical understanding of the Trinity, which by the time he, he, he was alive, the Trinity was well um, confirmed throughout the church. He had no understanding of the doctrine of, in, uh, of incarnation or imputed, imputation these essential doctrines of the faith that were worked out throughout the church, he had no concept of. But nevertheless, he assumed that he was in line with the, the prophets of the Old and New Testament, so he, he assumed that he would be received by the church and by Jews. He seemed to have a favorable opinion of both Jews and Christians, and he would lump Jews and Christians together. He didn't see them, he saw them as distinct groups, but yet, in some ways, he, he, he pushed them together as monotheistic. And he called them the people of the book. The people of the book were both Jews and Christians. And the early revelations that he received were very favorable to both Jews and Christians. And, and Surah 53, 36 says, Oh, he is not informed what is in the pages of scriptures of Moses and of Abraham, who conveyed all that Allah ordered them to convey. In 287, we gave Moses the book and followed him up with a secessions, secession of messengers. 4163, we have sent three inspirations as we sent it to Noah and the messengers after him. We sent inspiration to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, the tribes to Jesus. Job, Jonah, Aaron, Solomon, and to David we gave the Psalms. 3.3 3 says, It is he who sent down the three, step by step in truth, the book, confirming what went before it. And he sent down the law of Moses and the gospel of Jesus before this as a guide to mankind. He sent down criterium of judgment between right and wrong. 5.46 And in their footsteps we sent Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the law that had come before him. We sent him the gospel therein we, with guidance and light and confirmation of the law that had come before him. A guidance in a, to all who fear Allah. So Muhammad is writing these, and, and these revelations, we can understand, were written early on in his ministry. And he's writing like, if you, 
he's writing favorable to, towards the people of the book. In fact, Muhammad seemed to believe the scriptures. Now, he didn't possess a copy of them. And the reason we know he didn't is because he misrepresents the scriptures in the Quran. We know he didn't have real access to them because he's not quoting the scriptures or even referencing the scriptures in a proper way. You can tell he just has traditional traditions that were handed down to him, world traditions, and he refers to the, some stories of the Old Testament. He refers to the Gospels, but not in a proper way. But he assumed that the scriptures, Old and New Testament, would, would confirm him as the prophet. And that the new revelation that he's receiving would be coherent in agreement with both the Old and New Testament. And these revelations seem to indicate that. In fact, 568, he says, Muhammad, Say, O people of the Scripture, you have guidance in, you do not have guidance until you observe the Torah and the Gospel. And that which was revealed unto you from your Lord. He's saying you have guidance. Or you won't have guidance until you go back to your scriptures. Read your scriptures. 1094. If thou be in doubt concerning that which we have sent down unto thee, then ask those who have read the books before thee. Assuredly hath the truth come unto thee from thy Lord. So be not of those who doubt. So you, you want to know if we're teaching the truth, go back to your books. God has revealed you the truth. That's how you know, you're going to know that we are speaking from the truth. So if you're questioning me, Muhammad says, go back to your scriptures. They will confirm me. 2946. He's, this is a revelation given to Muslims. And do not dispute with the people of the book. Don't argue with Christians and Jews. Save those of them who do wrong. And say, we believe in that which hath been sent down unto us, and that which has been sent down unto you. Our God, your God, is one. Unto him we are submissive. Now, so Muslims are saying, your God's our God. We believe what's been sent down to us, and we believe what's been sent down to you. So here in the Quran, the Quran is saying, Muslims believe the Old and New Testament. That's what it's saying. In fact, one of the Hadiths says, Then Adam said unto him, O Moses, Allah favored you with his talk. And he wrote the Torah to you with his own hand. So, during the early periods, he's in Mecca, he's preaching, and he's preaching peace, if you would. He's preaching in a way that he's assuming that he truly is the next prophet coming after the apostles and Jesus. He's preaching in a way he thinks that the Christians and Jews are going to embrace him as one of their own. And also during this period, not only did he assume that he was one with all monotheists, he was pacifist, or he was a pacifist towards the polytheist. In Surah 4389, it says, Turn away from them, talking about the polytheist, and say peace to them, for they will come to know. So he's optimistic that the polytheistic, in time, be patient with them, they'll come and be submissive to Allah. 7.199 says, Show forgiveness, enjoy what is good, turn away from the foolish. Do, the foolish is the polytheist. Don't punish them. In fact, we already learned last night about the satanic verses and a period of, of uh, kind of despair. He's preaching and think about this first 10 years of his ministry. He's preaching monotheism. He's preaching that he's the prophet. He's a religious reformer. He's not a politician. He's not a military leader. He's a religious reformer preaching basically religious truth. There's one God. But the first 10 years, at the end of, of the 10-year period, 
the estimate is that he either has 40 or 60 followers, between 40 and 60 followers. I mean, think about preaching for 40, 10 years. In the end, you only have your family. Basically, his wife, his cousins, his friends, 40 followers believe him. And he's, he's thinking, if this is of God, why is not more people believing me? And then in Surah 53, 19 to 23, he, he, he gives these revelations that says that the polytheistic gods in Mecca can be prayed to and God will hear their prayer. Yes, God is still, Allah is still the chief absolute God, but these other gods could be prayed to and their intercessions would make a difference before God. In 620, towards the end of the Mecca period, he travels to the seven heavens and meets God on a winged steed with Gabriel next to him. And that's where he gets the five prayers. He's in Mecca in the middle of the night. He's transported on the steed to Jerusalem. And this is why Jerusalem is a holy city to them. And we know where the Dome of the Rock is. There at the Dome of the Rock, he ascends to heavens. And they believe in seven heavens. And that's why I've ever heard seven heavens comes from Islam. Muhammad goes into the seven heavens. And each, each heaven, there is a Old Testament prophet. And Jesus is in the third heaven, by the way. And he's, there's Noah, there's Adam, there's Jesus, there's Abraham, and so forth, until you get to the seventh heaven, until he actually meets God face to face. And there, when he finally gets to God, God gives him 50 prayers for the people. The people need to pray 50 times a day. And so he comes back down and he meets Adam. I think Adam may be at the sixth or the fifth heaven, and Adam says, man, you can't give 50 prayers. That's, that's too much. People be praying all day. They won't have time to work, have time to do anything else. That's too laborious. Go back to God and ask if he can reduce it. And he goes back to God, and he bows down to all, and he says, all that 50 prayers is a lot. Can you reduce that? He reduces down to 45, and that process goes back to Adam, and Adam says, that's still too much. And he goes to 40, then to 35. It finally gets down to five. And that's why Muslims pray five times a day. And that's the second pillar of Islam, Salat, the five obligatory prayers. Well, that's at 620. And he begins to, not only is he not received, towards the end of his preaching ministry in Mecca, he begins to be persecuted. Now it's debated to see how much he was persecuted, but one of the reasons the persecution increases is because his uncle dies. And his uncle was very influential in Mecca. Uh, and when his uncle dies, it's like his protection was gone. And he begins to be persecuted. One of his followers, one of the 40 or 60 followers, uh, was heavily persecuted. And so in the middle of the night, he learns about an ambush, that they were going to come and attack him, maybe even a plot to murder Muhammad. And Muhammad is warned of this in the middle of the night. Him and his follows, followers flee from Mecca, and they go to Medina. And in fact, this is the flight away from Mecca, and this is another one of the pillars of, um, uh, of Islam. You know, we have to travel to Mecca once in your lifetime, but once you get to Mecca, most Muslims, they go to Mecca, and when they're, after they, they walk around the Kaaba seven times, they reenact Muhammad's flight, and they they go the 250 miles uh, to Medina and reenact the flight of Muhammad. But he's ridiculed, he's persecuted, and so he flees 200 miles to the north to Medina. And that ends the first period of his ministry. The first period of his ministry, most of his revelations are very peaceful and religious in nature. A religious reformer, if you would, basically preaching, Allah is one, I am his prophet, and we've got to prepare for the judgment day. 75% of the Quran is revealed to him during the first 10 years. 75% of it is very peaceful. 
And you ask yourself, is Islam a religion of peace? And they'll say yes. Many of them will say yes. And they'll look at 75% of the Quran and say, here's the evidence of how peaceful we are. We worship the same God as Jews and Christians. One God. Um, and, and so they look at that. But there was a, a change in Muhammad's life after he fled to Medina. From 622 to the year he died, he, he begins basically, a, he becomes a political leader. When he gets to Medina, the Medina welcomed him. In fact, Medina and Mecca were rival cities. So they didn't like Mecca. So Medina's like, okay, we, we accept you. You're coming from Mecca. You don't like the Meccans. We don't like the Meccans. Also, uh, Medina had three major Jewish tribes. A few Christians, but mainly Jews and polytheists. And the polytheists were made of Arabs. So you had Arabs and you had Jews. And for a hundred years in Medina, they fought one another. So you have this hundred year conflict in Medina and they can't get along because here you got Arabs not getting along with the, with the, uh, with the Jews. And Muhammad is an Arab. But he's also a monotheist. And because he's a monotheist, the Jews were like, okay, he's one of us. Because he's an Arab, the Arabs said, he's one of us. So because of them not liking Mecca and the fact that he's, he's kind of a, a perfect in-between, he's an Arab, monotheistic Arab, he quickly was received into the city and made a political leader. In fact, he, he, he rose to leadership First of all, becoming an arbitrator between the Arabs and the Jews. I mean, this is amazing. He went from being persecuted, not having anything, to all of a sudden into power. And we know what power can do to people. And this is what it seems to have done to Muhammad. But Muhammad, at the beginning of this, in 622... He brought peace. I mean, he did something miraculous. He brought peace between the Arabs and the Jews. In fact, he, he constructed the constitution of Medina. It was a peace treaty between the, the Jews and the Arabs. He gave rights to non-Muslims, and he appeased the Jews. And one of the revelations he had the, was that you pray towards Jerusalem. He gets a revelation. A Quranic revelation. We pray to Jerusalem. And of course, the Jews like that, right? Because that's the way they pray. That's the direction they pray. So he gets this revelation that we pray to Jerusalem. Uh, he, he, so he brings a measure of peace within the city. And then he, with a little extra followers, I mean, I don't know what the statistics are. He went from a group of 40. By that time, he had more. And he begins to raid the caravans of Mecca. There was a trade route. They would take their goods. The Meccans would take their goods on these trade routes. And what uh, Muhammad would do, him and his followers, they would go and ambush these caravans. And they justified this because they were just trying to get their own stuff back. They had to flee and leave their houses, their homes, their goods, their possessions. And Mecca, they had to escape for their lives. They escaped empty-handed, and they said, this stuff's just our stuff. The Meccans stole our stuff, so we're going to just kind of steal it back. So they justified these raids, and they began to go on more and more raids. Um, in 622, he murders the first Jew, 622. So all of a sudden, you know, there's a change taking place in Muhammad. In the earliest biography of Muhammad, which was written in the 9th century, this is the earliest historical biography written by a Muslim, pro-Muslim, righteous biography. 
And there was this Jewish poet who made fun of Muhammad in one of his poems, wrote something negative about Muhammad. And Muhammad was incensed by this. And the biography says this. Who, this is Muhammad speaking, who will rid me of this poet? And one of his followers volunteered and said, I will deal with him for you, O apostle of God. I will kill him. And the prophet responded by saying, do so if you can. The prophet also explicitly gave his assassins permission to lie and to use trickery in order to accomplish their mission. The report goes on to describe how the prophet's followers deceived the old man out of his house in the middle of the night and jumped on him with swords and daggers and brutally murdered him. After completing their mission, the followers reported back to the prophet that they had killed God's enemy. The author concludes this in, by writing, Our attack upon God's enemy cast terror upon the Jews, and there was no Jew in Medina who did not fear for his life. So, first he, he makes peace with the Jews. The Jews begin not to accept him as his prophet. They, they, they said, you're not one of us. A Jew makes fun of him, so he has him killed. And from that point forward, all the Jews in Medina, as the Barghi says, feared for their lives. They did not trust Muhammad from that point forward. Well, in 624, we have the Battle of Butter, and this is where things really change. We had these caravan, caravan raids that was going on through all this time. Uh, but um, at this battle, the Meccans had gathered up 10,000 troops. They had an overwhelming army. They wanted to crush Muhammad and the Muslims. And the Muslims feared for their lives and they didn't want to fight. Because they knew it was a suicide mission. And all of a sudden, you're talking about revelations of convenience. All of a sudden, he gets these revelations that promises paradise if you happen to die. Do, you know, so Muhammad doesn't want his, his army to, to, um, to, you know, flee. So he promises them paradise. Surah 474 says, Let those fight in the way of Allah will see, will sell their life of this world, for the other, whosoever fights in the way of Allah and he is slain, or if he's victorious, he shall receive a great or vast reward. Chapter 9, 111 says, Allah had purchased of the believers their persons and their goods, for theirs in return is the garden of paradise. They fight in his cause, they are slain. I promise binding on him in truth through the law, the gospel, and the Quran. And who is more faithful to his covenant than Allah? Then rejoice in the bargain which you have concluded. Another revelation. He prophesied. Now this revelation was prophesied earlier when he was in, in Mecca. But nevertheless, in 7831, he says, those who are dutiful, and are successful, receive paradise, gardens, vineyards, young, full-breasted, mature maidens of equal age, and a full cup of wine. And in the Hadiths, it talks about how paradise, heaven, is a place of sexual pleasure, a place of where all your five senses are, are gratified. And, um, and so it's really begin, it's, it's almost like Muhammad is, is encouraging people to fight for his cause and promising them that all their wildest dreams will be fulfilled. Nevertheless, Muslims only had 300 and they won the battle. 
And they, this was a sign that they thought was from God that Muhammad truly was the prophet. And after they won this amazing battle, it was like then when he was in Medina, that's when his power really, um, that's when he began to, basically all of the polytheistic became Muslims. Either they converted or they were fled away. And that's when a couple of the Jewish tribes were kicked out of Medina. And then he changes in February the 11th, 624, he he gets a new revelation where you no longer pray to Jerusalem, but you pray towards Mecca. And then he begins to have a kind of a revelations that are not in favor of the people of the book. And he begins to say the people of the book do not, he's not saying they have a twisted scriptures or their scriptures are corrupt. The Quran never says the scriptures are corrupt. The Quran never claims that the Bible has been uh, corrupted in its transmission. It never makes that claim. So Muslims today make that claim. The Quran says the Bible is trustworthy and that we're to read it. But what Muhammad begins to get revelation saying is the people of the book are not properly teaching their scriptures. They're withholding truth or they're misinterpreting truth and they're doing it knowingly and purposefully because of their Sin and rebellion. It says, he gets a revelation in 2, 146. The people of the book know this and they know as they know their own sons. But some of them conceal the truth which they themselves know. The truth is from the Lord. In 624 to 625, Muhammad expels two of the three tribes of the Jews, he receives more revelation, and he gets, a, uh, in 48.29, he says, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those with him are forceful against the unbelievers. So all of a sudden, now you see, rather than say peace to those who disagree, we get a revelation to say, be forceful towards those who unbelieve. 5.33 the punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his apostle and strive to make mischief in the land is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides as they should be in prison. This shall be a disgrace for them in this world and the hereafter they shall have a grievous chastisement. Sir 9.5, when the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captive, and besiege them, and prepare for them each ambush. 929, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, until they pay the tax with willing submission, and feel themselves subdued. So here's a change, right? It just so happens this change of revelation is coinciding with the rise of power and muscle and the sword. When he was just a religious reformer in Mecca, he only had 40 followers. It was peace, peace. Now when he has, he's becoming more heavily armed and begin to be making these alliance with their surrounding city-states there in Arabia, it becomes more and more powerful. Now he's getting revelation say, saying, strive against the unbelievers. Slay them where you find them. 973, O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them for their abode is in hell. 9111, 9111 says, Surely Allah has brought of the believers their persons and their property for this that they shall have the garden, they fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. 4735, be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace when you should be utmost, for Allah is with you and will never put you in loss for your good deeds. A couple of the Hadiths 
Say all as apostle said, I have ordained to fight with the people till they say, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. Fight with them until none, none that you encounter will worship Allah and him alone. Another hadith says, it is not fitting for a prophet that he should have prisoners of war and free them with ransom until he has made a great slaughter among his enemies. Here's another hadith. Whoever changes his Islamic religion, whoever diverts from Islam, forsakes Islam, kill them. Well, And finally, he raises up enough troops and allegiances with, an, with surrounding city-states that he takes his vengeance out upon Mecca. Um, but before he, he does that, there's this, the Meccans come and it's called the, the Battle of the Trench. And basically, the Meccans brought 10,000 troops around Medina to siege it. And for 27 days sought to um, besiege the city. But afterwards, Muhammad, they, they made it through the siege. In fact, because of the weather, the Meccans had to flee. And after that, he, Muhammad, the one remaining Jewish tribe that was still in Medina, he killed all the men and young men. From t probably around 12 years and older, he killed all the Jews that were left in Medina, over 600 of them. And the young children and women he sold into slavery. But in 629, he went towards Mecca. He conquered Mecca. And in 632, he does a farewell pilgrimages. He died in the year 632. So in this, we see two sections of Muhammad's life, our public ministry. You have the first 10 years and the second 10 years. First 10 years, you have prophecies or revelation of peace in support of both Jews and Christians, or at least very favorable towards Jews and Christians. Uh, prophecies that says that the Torah and the Gospels are reliable revelations to be, to be read and believed that as the Jews and Christians did not receive him as a prophet, as he fled into Medina and became a, real, a political leader and even a general in an army, if you would, his revelations changed and he became violent towards Jews and Christians. So, when we look at the Quran, can we look at this and see, does this present a co cohesive worldview? The Quran says that the, the book that has been revealed cannot be changed or altered. But what we see, we see a Quranic verse say, pray towards Jerusalem, and then a few years later, a chronic verse that says, pray towards Mecca. How do we deal with these contradictions? Muslims deal with it with the doctrine of abrogation. In fact, Surah 2, 106, which was one of the last surahs to be revealed, conveniently he gets another revelation that kind of takes care of all the contradictions in the Quran. And it reads this, whatever communications we abrogate are caused to be forgotten. We bring one that is better than it or like it. Do you not know Allah has power over all things? Do you not know Allah can say one thing now and then later say something different? He has power to do that. And if we say something that seems to be in contradiction to what we said earlier, do you not know that we're, we're not saying anything but something better? I want to know how could this be if the Quran is not created and is eternal. It's not like they believe that God is progressive in learning 
and trying to figure out things as he goes. Why, why give a chronic revelation to say, pray towards Jerusalem if God Allah knew all along that is Mecca in which you should pray towards? There's many other, other contradictions, but even I think the peaceful verses seem to be abrogated by the more violent verses. So with this said, I would use this as a means of, of questioning Muslims. Do you have a consistent revelation? And I would say they do not. If you would, let's close this session in prayer and we'll come back and we'll look at our next session on the question of salvation. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the truth that you've revealed to us in the Bible. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that although you have, we have progressive revelation in scriptures, we have different covenants. These covenants may have been abrogated in the scriptures, dear Lord, with, with different particular commands given to the Jews that are not necessarily enforced to us Christians. We're thankful, Lord, we still have a cohesive worldview because of the nature of the covenants. But dear Lord, we're thankful for truth. We're thankful for the word of God that is reliable, trustworthy, and truly is something it's, it's, it's not contradictory in its nature. Lord, we pray that you give us wisdom in how we interact with Muslims. And dear Lord, give us uh, desire to please you and uphold the word of God. This we pray in your son's name.